Emily, we're ready to begin. <laughs> Yay. How is everybody? Wonderful. Good. Hey, Emily. I love nothing more than to watch the numbers go up and see all the faces pop up. <laughs> okay. One thing to add real quickly. Okay, is Candace on yet? Great. We'll wait two more minutes and then we'll start for everybody. Does that sound good, Paul? Remember Paul Gedges? Uh, we are live and recording, so whenever you want to start. Okay, I'm just going to add one slide about the uh, CLE real quickly. Yeah, you made kind of a bonus, Emily, turning it into a CLE. I like it. Well, it's because I'm the water bar chair, and I thought it'd be best to double dip. <laughs> um, okay. Great idea. So um, I think we are ready to start. Um, I want to, first of all, say welcome to 2021. It is a brand new year, hopefully a bright and exciting one for everybody. Um, 2021 or 2020, it was a difficult and long challenge, and I'm glad that we are all here and can meet together, even if it is uh, over the internet and we are not all together as people like we generally are. But um, so today is uh, kind of our six month update for the uh, State Water Marketing Development Strategy Group, otherwise known as the Water Banking Group here in Utah. Um, today's uh, meeting is ostensibly a six month update about where we are on the project, but also um, since we've kind of begun the project here in July in earnest, a lot of new folks have also been, become interested. And so a little bit of it is going to be a little bit repetitive for some of you who've been involved in the project for quite some time. But as we've begun to actually kind of work with water users and work with the statute, we've also kind of come to better understand kind of the very uh, aggressive and ambitious project that we started three years ago. And so I do think that um, even some of the repetitive items for folks might be um, a kind of a good refresher and also to kind of see how the conversation um, is developing. Um, the meeting is set for two hours. I'm really hoping that we don't need to have that much time. Um, I think it'd be nice to keep kind of substantive discuss substantive about 45 minutes or so. And we'd really like to leave a large amount of time available for questions and comments and thoughts because um, for those of you who did not participate in the working group to date, what genius of the process 2017 through 2020 is having these large discussions amongst kind of interested and informed water users and stakeholders. So I'm gonna present, let me know if you can see it. Great, awesome. 
Also, um, there are, this was on LinkedIn as well. So um, there might be a larger audience than just the Utah audience. So those of you who are out of state, you know, this is probably a good way to kind of get informed about what we're doing here in Utah. And if you have water banking activities in your state, you know, we would love to hear what you're doing and see, you know, if there are some things that we can steal in here in Utah because it's silly to reinvent the wheel. So just a quick housekeeping matter. If you were here to get CLE credit through the Utah Bar, they do need a record of your attendance. And due to the uh, online format, it's difficult to tell who actually attended. So either please put your name in the chat column and Lydia from the Bar will review you that way. Directly email Lydia at the Bar at um, CLE at Utah.gov. Oh, no, that's not it. That's not the, the CLE at utahbar.com or .org. I'm not sure. You guys will have to look that up. But, oh, a lot of them. I like it. Okay. Emily, so, we could, Emily, if we could pause here and let the chat messages turn down until we proceed. Perfect. Oh, this is a good idea. This definitely increased our participation by like 20%. <laughs> And also, for those of you who haven't participated, we're a very informal group. So, like, you know, please, if you have something interesting you want to say or comment or participate in, um, you know, don't don't be afraid or hesitate. So, we're at ninety nine attendees. I want one more person to join to hit the century mark. Oh, we did it! Thank you, whoever that last person was. Fantastic. Okay. Looks like that is slowing down. Um, if you come in and if someone joins in, hopefully they'll see that. If you didn't get a chance to enter it, please do now or email the bar. So, okay. So um, I think it's really important, especially in today's day and age where we are in so many meetings electronically, we're not seeing each other face to face, to also kind of define the purpose of a meeting. Um, you know, this meeting kind of serves three specific purposes. Um, I want, it's really to give a project update and report on the progress of um, the water statewide water marketing strategies development which is also known as water banking and i'm going to kind of talk about that distinction here in, in the presentation um the other aspect of it is to kind of solicit some feedback from the stakeholder group um you know we as a project management team who i'll talk about here in a minute have been working with this material pretty intimately for the last six months and we have kind of uh I don't want to say repackaged, but evolved some of our thinking on how we are articulating some of the themes of the project. And so we really want to make sure it is in line with kind of what the stakeholder group had in mind that developed the Water Banking Act and that has participated to date. Um, my, my impression is that that we are, but I, I really want to make sure that that, that is accurate and, and we're not speaking for other people. Um, and then really the third opportunity is to provide some an open forum for stakeholder discussions. This particular project has garnered a lot of interest both here in Utah and outside the state. Um, there's still a lot of questions um, um, we don't know the answers to, but really um, we want to provide an opportunity for everyone to um, ask questions or provide input or just kind of have a dialogue. So it's kind of like the three purposes of the meeting. And first of all, keeping our friends and colleagues in the know, because I think that very much this project to date has been a friends and colleagues project, and we want to make sure that everybody continues to feel that way. So I'm going to go through um, a brief project background, um, project progress. What are we learning? Because I do think that, you know, an, an ancillary issue outside the specific brass tacks of what we're doing with the project is, you know, really kind of making some notes and talking about what are we learning about this kind of concept in general, and then how can those concepts be applied to our broader goal of eventually having a statewide water marketing strategies report. And then the fourth item is gonna be having an open forum. So the brief project background is actually a little bit longer than I had originally anticipated. Um, 
And that's really because I wanted to reflect some of the evolutions we've been having. So I apologize for those of you who've gone to this meeting like 18 times. Um, but for those of you who are it's new, I think it would be really helpful. So kind of a brief background and a summary is like this effort, the effort between 2017 and 2020 is really um, by water users for water users. Like this entire water banking and water marketing strategy report has been intended to be of benefit to the water user community and is reflective of sentiments from the water user community. Um, to get to where we are now, I put a gargantuan stakeholder effort to design a process that promotes market activities that are favorable to water users. And I do not believe that our gargantuan is an understatement in this particular case. Um, lots, I mean, thousands and thousands of hours have uh, come up to this point to date. So generally, um, we, we have done a lot of uh, presentations on this topic um, in the 2017 to 2020 uh, era, our 2019 era really. Um, a lot of our discussions focused on kind of why we were doing this, like what is the need. This topic in the conversation today is not so much to talk about that, but more to talk about what are we doing. But I do think it is really important to also set the stage about why this is activity is even occurring. So, you know, looking ahead, um, all of us know because we work in the water field, there is so much much need for water and there's a lot of need for control. Um, I think, uh, you know, with increasing populations, with development, with water needed for recreation, with not water needed for environment and water quality, with water needed for agriculture production, with drought and climate conditions, and the new demands that we don't even know are coming, you know, we're going to be, we're, there's going to be a lot of groups competing for very, very limited resources. And so, um, this, this uh, graph right here, I think, says a lot. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with the state of Utah's growth projections, you know, we are anticipated to double our population growth by 2065, or about double. Um, I think we're still on track with those particular numbers. And so, um, you know, a, a primary driving factor is we're just more people, and we're going to have a lot more demand for that water. So, you know, Utah is not alone in this. Um, other states across the Western United States are also experiencing competing demands. Um, some of our sister states like Colorado have, um, who are, you know, about 15 years ahead of us have um, dealt with this ahead of us. Um, that has resulted in um, increased activity for buying and leasing of water rights. And in some cases that works out really well for the local community and in other cases it has left local communities devastated. You know, when the water leaves the local economy, it generally also has a, a negative impact. Um, in our prior presentations, we discussed a lot about the impacts of buy and dry on local agricultural communities. Um, so that's one impact, but there are a lot of other impacts. And so Really, uh, where this has kind of led us to is that with such high demand for water, there's a lot of concern in the local communities about maintaining control over the terms and conditions for these market activities. And so, you know, usually, as everyone here probably is aware, water is a hyper-local uh, hyper um, matter. And so uh, we want to make sure that those who have the water rights and those who want the water rights and those who are the local water users interested in using water really have control over the terms and conditions of how that water gets used to meet this coming and future demand. And so as a note, that's a little bit of a tweak on some of the discussions we had in the working groups, um, but I think it's some of the evolution that we've been finding as we've been walking with, working with local water users. So we're much more kind of focusing on, you know, the concept of general water market activities. Water banking is a key component of that, but I think just recognizing that water market activities are happening at an increased rate, and really a lot of this effort is to figure out what are we going to do to make sure those activities are are working for our water users, and they're receiving the benefit of um, having those water rights. So just a quick review for those who aren't familiar. Um, this is about, we're moving into our fourth year of this project. Um, in 2017 was kind of the initial year where a lot of this started. In 2017, there were kind of four threads of activity 
that um, were ha happening simultaneously. There was an ag optimiz optimization working group that was kind of uh, spearheaded by Representative Tim Hawks. And that was looking at um, a number of ways that the agricultural community could, you know, uh, utilize their water rights and water assets to their benefit. You know, agriculture here in the state of Utah is still a very large economic driver. And that group is kind of intended to look at ways that um, the ag community could um, participate and kind of uh, dictate some of the uh, development for water. Um, Senator e Janie Iwamoto also had a bill in 2017 that was very simple. But pretty much what it did is it added uh, the ability for municipalities to have in-stream flow rights. And so um, here in Utah, if you're not a Utah resident or a Utah practitioner, we have a very limited in-stream flow statute. And um, in 2017, there was a much greater desire to look at in-stream flows for municipal water quality purposes. And so that bill actually did not pass, but it was asked to go back and form a study group to uh, kind of study those issues and what we could do as a community to address uh, in-stream flows from a water quality perspective. Um, in addition to that, Central Utah Water Conservancy District had the had some exploratory discussions about creating what they had considered the Bonneville Bank, and that was looking at water banking for Central Utah Water Conservancy District's purposes. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Central, they are the largest wholesaler of water in the state of Utah. They are also um, the recipient of federal water pro water from federal water projects, and um, have a large commitment to serve uh, a growing population population. So they were very interested in looking at how water banking um, could basically work for them. And then the fourth strand in 2017 was that um, we completed the governor's water strategy report. And this was a uh, consensus document drafted by a number of water users. And really the effort on that part was to identify what are we going to do in the future to uh, address Utah's water needs. And that report Support water banking and water markets as um, a very key uh, key mechanism to explore for a number of purposes, both water quality, for in-stream flows, for agriculture, for you know all kinds of reasons. That the water markets and water banking is you know listed about five or six times in that report for, under different recommendations. So in 2019 through 2018. Um, um, we had uh, all four of these groups kind of converged into a mega group of which probably about 60 of you on this call, you know, participated in. Um, I have so many meetings on there because we literally had so many meetings. <laughs> but the goal of that effort was to get a, a, a temperature on the pulse of the water user community. You know, what do we want? What does water banking mean to Utah? How, what is, how, how is water banking, you know, what is and what can we do to design something that is a Utah solution for Utah needs. So in 2019, we got a Senate joint resolution that provided legislative authority to continue to explore these concepts. At that point in time, we also received a $400,000 appropriation to fund the exploration of these concepts. Um, we also received an additional $400,000 through the BOR's Water Smart Water Marketing Grant. Um, we completed draft consensus legislation at the end of 2019. Um, I probably added is uh, Title 73, Chapter 31. And now that was uh, passed in early 2020. Um, the other thing we did in 2018 and 2019 is we took our concepts and ideas uh, across the state of Utah. So we did over 60 different speaking events. Um, and, you know, we went to Emory County, we went to Cache County, we went to Salt Lake County, we went to board, you know, we went to conferences. Pretty much people were sick of seeing about our faces. But that was really good because we got a lot of really good feedback from the water user community about our ideas and thoughts. So in 2020, we have the water banking statute passed and we have a funding and authorization to start what we are calling the statewide water marketing development strategy project, which is AKA the water banking project. So what did we say was important? You know, what, what was the consensus of that? So really, again, um, this is repetitive for those who've been here before, but voluntary, temporary and local. You know, those are the three themes that no matter what we did here in Utah, those three themes had to be um, incorporated into our water banking concepts. 
And the working thesis of the group was to better support Utah's growing water demands. Water banking could facilitate local voluntary and temporary transfers of water that generate income for water right owners and increase access to water. So that was kind of like what our goal was for this effort. So this is kind of um, what the Water Banking Act is in six steps. Um, it's a very big piece of legislation. Um, I think that is reflective of the fact that it is a consensus bill and, and lots of folks wanted to make sure it was protective of their interests. And I think at the end, we got a really, really good piece of legislation, though I do think it will be you know, onerous to work through here at the beginning. But at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do with the water banking bill is we are trying to promote the development of voluntary, of temporary, voluntary, and locally directed leasing arrangements for the use of water rights. So it's based on water rights, and these are leasing arrangements. The other thing the bill did is it, it addressed a couple barriers that were impeding flexible use of water that came from the water user community. Those barriers were identified by the water user community and it requested several benefits um, that, you know, it, you know, that the water user community thought would be helpful to them to better use their water. Um, really, the crux of the bill is it gives water users the ultimate flexibility to design a leasing arrangement that meets local conditions. So this is the site size in the local bank, which water rights are going to participate, lease terms, conditions for leasing, distribution of proceeds, et cetera. We in the past have kind of called this the, um, the in the past we have called this uh, kind of the uh, laboratory of democracy. Our, our, our intention is that these banks are going to look very different across the state of Utah because all we really are doing is saying, you know, here are some guideposts for what a water bank could look like, but it's really up to the local water users to take ownership of the project and the bank themselves and to design something that works for them. And if you do so, you can get these benefits that have been identified. Um, the act works by basically having interested water users can apply to the, to the Utah Board of Water Resources to have a qualifying lease arrange proved as a water bank. And so we're going to talk about there's two different kinds of leasing arrangements under the act. And then once you're approved, you're extended certain benefits. And I'll explain those a little more better. Importantly, though, this is an exploratory effort. So the Water Banking Act right now has a 10-year sunset period. So we have a 10-year period of time to really explore these concepts on the ground. If it turns out they do not benefit local water users, then the act will sunset. If we need to modify it, we will do so. Or if we need to, uh, if we like the way it's going, then we'll vote to kind of continue. So it's kind of the key concepts. So pretty much what are we doing in a nutshell? We're promoting the development of market tools favorable to local water users. That's really what we're doing. We're trying to figure out a way to put the local people in control of the markets in their area. So to do this, you know, we have this act, it's very big, it's very long, it's very complicated. And, and, you know, even though the genesis of it is from the stakeholder community and the goal is simple, it's not a, uh, this is a kind of a newer item for Utah. And so we really wanted to make sure that we understood how the act was going to apply and we understood how the concepts were going to be developed. And so this is where the statewide water marketing strategies project comes into being. So basically what we're going to be doing is with the grant funding and appropriations we received, we're going to explore the development of market tools by basically piloting the Utah Water Banking Act in three pilot areas. So this is a three-year effort. Our pilot areas are um, up here in kind of lower cash value. And I'll give you guys an update on each of these later in the presentation. Um, we have a, a pilot area in Snyderville Basin and then one in the Price River area. And those three areas were chosen because there was an expressed interest from local water users to want to try and apply the act in their area. And also they kind of represented different water needs. You know, Valley, you know, there's a, there's some need for additional access to agriculture water or water for agricultural purposes. Um, up in Snyderville Basin, we've got some water quality and in-stream flow questions. And then down the Price River area, we also have kind of a mix of agricultural interests as well as an interest in exploring some 
um, environmental purposes um, and in-stream flows. So kind of a mix of water uses and that's kind of why uh, those three areas were chosen. Additionally, at the end of this effort, we're going to produce a statewide marketing strategies report, which is going to summarize the lessons learned, um, provide guidance, um, to local water users. And then through this three-year effort, we will have hopefully de developed a number of tools for water users to use, such as checklists and forms and handbooks and kind of like conceptual guides to allow them to apply the Water Banking Act more easily in their local area. So this is kind of a, a graphic of the project timeline. We have, um, you know, it started, uh, in the actual project itself started in, on July 1st, 2020. So we started this summer. Um, we'd hope to start a little bit earlier, but due to COVID, um, things are moving just slower in general. And so, you know, in July was kind of where we ended up. The timeline of the project, you know, we've kind of got this project inception, you know, draft legislation, stakeholder outreach, coordinate initial pilot activities. Most of this occurred prior to 2020. Um, and then, you know, kind of the bulk of the project is kind of getting these pilot projects, you know, going with outreach and analysis. And there are a couple separate different, um, you know, sub tasks inside getting these pilot projects going. You know, we've got outreach and public input. We've got scoping for technical analysis, legal analysis, hydrologic analysis, you know, demand analysis in each of the pilot areas to kind of help local water users. And then that will also lead to helping those local water users get a water bank application that is eligible to be approved as a water bank and also help with a corresponding change application and water rights into water bank. Um, it was intended, there was hopefully about an eight month period about where water banks would actually operate. Um, each of the pilots are kind of operating on their own time frame, and so we might get one of the pilots inside that time frame. I think realistically, the other two are going to be a little bit behind that. Um, just to note, the project management team is actually not really involved in the pilot projects during this period. We are in correspondence with the pilot projects, but this is really intended to be uh, hands off and kind of let the project run to see how it goes and then kind of like check back in with the water users and kind of do lessons learned. Um, and then we're going to review what happened and do some reports. And then from that, we have kind of like the end year, end stage of the project, which is the creation of a statewide marketing strategy report, public input, and then finalize the report. So the water banking project team is, um, you know, now that we've got the funding, now that we've got the statute, now that we've got the concepts for how we want to particularly look at those. Um, we put together a team that has a diverse set of expertise relevant for assisting local water users. Um, Clyde Snow and Sessions, which is the law firm that I work for, uh, was selected as the project manager. Um, a law firm is not typically who you, you would look to as a project manager, but we were heavily, heavily involved in the drafting of the legislation and the working group efforts and um, have, you know, kind of like the local contacts to continue that effort. And so it made sense for this project. Uh, Westwater Research out of Colorado, um, primarily under the supervision of Brett Bobey, um, is helping us with water markets and project administration. They've been amazing. Brett's been great. He's on the call now. Um, and the Palmer team is helping our project and Steve Turin and his team, um, they're helping with engineering assistance and helping with some of our scoping analysis tasks. Um, I also did include, they're officially, you know, on the project management team, but this is a Utah Division of Water Resources project. Um, you know, they're our contractor. And we've been working heavily with the Division of Water Rights. And so I think that, you know, they I would consider them part of our project team. Um, we also have a number of project partners, you know, the local water users who, who, have, who are in the pilot areas. We have in-kind contributing partners who have been participating to date, who are now working in the local areas. We have some state advisory boards, some folks who are kind of giving us some feedback. Some of you have seen this graph, 
I can, I don't need to go into it, but I love it because it's fancy and it looks nice. <laughs> but pretty much this is kind of the project in a nutshell. The project in the nutshell is kind of just like a lot of communication. You know, we are doing, you know, we're working in each of the three pilot areas. We're doing, you know, this little flywheel of kind of what we're doing in each area, uh, you know, develop bank development, scoping, regulatory analysis, you know, stakeholder facilitation, you know, that's happening in each of the three areas, you know, that's kind of feeding back to kind of the larger group about kind of lessons learned and getting feedback. And then this is also going to kind of feed into, you know, what legislative tweaks do we need to make along the way for our water banking act? You know, what policies might we want to enter, what we might we want to implement to kind of promote the act and effort, et cetera. But in general, the role of the project management team that I'm seeing is kind of like threefold. It's to listen, to learn, and to lead. Like our goal is really to go out there and work with the local water users, listen to what their needs are, you know, learn how their systems work and kind of what 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 their desires are, and then help assist taking those local concepts and thoughts and putting them under the Water Banking Act if it, if it is a good fit. Part of this process is also determining whether or not the Water Banking Act is a good fit. Like you do not need um, you do not need a uh, the Water Banking Act to do a leasing arrangement in the state of Utah. You can do leasing arrangements anytime you want. But to get the benefits of the Water Banking Act, you know, um, a, a leasing arrangement that's eligible to be approved as a bank might be in your benefit and might work to the benefit of local water users. So kind of like what our role has been over the last six months um, is a couple, two couple fold. Uh, we are organized to assist the pilot area water users in piloting the act. And so that's helping them understand the purpose and function of the act, facilitating exploratory discussions between interested stakeholders, articulating the need and purpose for local water leasing. And I'm going to come back to that right there because that's a key, key component. Identifying and completing necessary technical scoping tasks, providing limited funding to assist with pilot bank water development. Um, we have about Thirty-five-ish thousand dollars uh, dedicated per pilot area that is solely to help the local water users test these concepts. And so, for example, some of the things we've talked about that funding going to assist with are, you know, purchasing some extra instrumentation so that we can better understand distributions. Um, some of the other things that we have um, thought about are you know, money for the local irrigation company or local water user to actually operate the water bank, you know, be, be the bank operator for this initial period. And so our, our role here really is to help the local water user and provide them resources, both in expertise, some funding, and just also kind of a process for, for moving forward. Um, the other thing we're doing is helping them design a leasing arrangement that's eligible to be approved as a water bank, you know, uh, we're going to assist in some respects um, in preparing the water bank and change application. Um, once those are approved, we, we're hands off, but, you know, getting to a point where those can be approved is really important. And then we're going to correspond with the banks during their initial operation stages. The other aspect of this is not only are we working with the local water users, but we're working with key stakeholders who are interested in this. There has been a ton of interest in this project. And so there are stakeholders who work across the state of Utah who are like, this could really work in my area. How, how do we think about this? And so part of our goal is also to keep those people informed. You know, one of the other goals is to make sure that we are keeping in constant contact with our state agency partners because we want to make sure that we are fully understanding what this current and existing state agency processes are so that when we develop something, it works with and in conjunction with state agency processes. And so that if there is interest and we do think this is gonna develop the way we think it might, those state agencies are ready, willing, and able to assist you know, with the water bank, with creating these water banks or with um, approving applications necessary for the water banks. Some of the other things we need to do is, you know, um, create legislative and policy recommendations. And then, as I said before, we're going to prepare the statewide water marketing report. So that's the background. Um, and now I'm going to move a little, into a little bit of project progress. I did see one person had a comment in the chat. 
For example, is a waterfall management area considered a local water user? Yeah, they could be a local water user. You know, local water users could be anybody who is looking to lease water. It could be agricultural purposes. It could be a local municipality. It could be a local reclamation district. It could be, you know, a nonprofit organization working in the area. Um, it could be a local district. Um, pretty much if, if you want to have the wet stuff flow through your project or through your hands, you're a local water user. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna take a sip of, speaking of water, All right, so if anybody doesn't have any more questions about the background, um, they pretty much like our project progress is, uh, I kind of want to talk, uh, I want to kind of leave a lot of space for questions. Um, and so I'm hoping that this, you know, that this kind of gives you a good idea of where we are and is not overkill, but also gives you enough to kind of ask some questions about where we are. Project progress. So this is my favorite slide of the presentation because this is how I feel most days. <laughs> so this project is very interesting because there's a lot of things happening simultaneously. And so I like this person of the um, plates because you know we're having simultaneous conversations with pilot project users, we're having simultaneous conversations with state agency partners, we're having simultaneous conversations with interested stakeholders, and you know we're trying to keep all all these things going at a pace where no one conversation gets out ahead of the other because it's very important that there's been a lot of investment and effort put into this process and so we want to make sure that you know we're kind of kind of in lockstep developing how this act is going to be applied so that you know we don't get an application that's you know someone submits an application and by the way, the, the statute is applicable across the state. It's not applicable just to the pilot projects. It's it's open now. If somebody wanted to do an application, they could. And so we just want to make sure that, you know, we're having the conversations kind of at all levels at the same time so that as the pilot projects and the projects get developed and the concepts in the local area start to get kind of firmed up, you know, the state agencies are also, you know, have been part of how they're developing their processes and also you know we're learning as we go so that if there's something that doesn't work for local water users we know that and can adjust the process as we go um, obviously this is not the olympics some days i think it feels like a, a five ring circus <laughs> but i think that that's kind of the fun of it um and then my favorite of all of it and i don't know how on this picture of this little guinea pig ready to give us his arm but I feel like, you know, this is a guinea pig project. You know, we don't know how it's going to work. We don't know how the act is going to work. We don't know how it's going to work in a specific area. We don't know how a statutory bank is going to be formed yet. And so it's a lot of beyond of questions. And so those who have participated to date have been exceptionally, um, have been exceptionally patient um and willing to engage in exploratory discussions. And I think it's really important that that con Concept stay, um, stay at the forefront of this. These first we pilot projects, and we're all kind of guinea pigs at the same time, hoping to have an outcome that benefits the community. Here's kind of where we are. Um, we have kind of completed all of the project action components. You know, our legislation is drafted. We've done our initial start outreach, you know, we've kind of coordinated initial pilot activities. Um, and now we're really moving into, um, you know, really getting into the pilot stage. Um, each one of the pilot projects is keen on its own time frame. And that is because the banks are really focused and dependent on local input and local interest. And so, you know, as our job, the project management team, we're not there to go build Build a band, help interested local water users build what they want to see. And so we'll we'll talk about this in a moment, but out of our three areas, the price area is the most out in front. And we'll kind of talk about why that is in a moment. But we have kind of moved very, very heavily into the scoping stage. You know, we're very much trying to figure out 
What are the volumes of water we're talking about? What are the technical considerations we need to consider? What are the legal ramifications we need to consider? You know, what is a change application going to look like? So the scoping really is, um, you know, we're really into the scoping stage there. The Snyderville Basin is kind of more in the middle of the outreach and scoping stage, and I'll, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, so we're kind of like moving more into kind of out of the initial meetings and into scoping. Um, and then the Cache Valley area, um, which is very much reflective of the water uses in the area, we're kind of still in the initial meeting stage. And that makes sense because this is probably most likely going to be more of an agricultural bank. And, you know, during the summer, producers are busy. And so, you know, we've really kind of discussions um, with interested stakeholders, you know, really haven't commenced until kind of those, those activities really ceased kind of the end of October, um, early November in, in kind of following the irrigation season. So that's kind of where we are six months in. We're, we're on track to kind of where we thought we'd be. Um, each one of these is working a little bit slower. And so uh, each one of these is working on their own time frame. But I think overall, we're very much kind of on track of kind of where we thought we'd be um, and things are moving well. So as part of the progress, I wanted to not only just talk about progress in terms of the pilot projects, but also like progress in terms of the evolution of how we're thinking about this act and how it's applied. And so one of the aspects of this is our progress in understanding the act and how to articulate it. Because for those of us who drafted the legislation, you know, we spent hundreds of hours in small rooms with you know, people, you know, talking about ifs and ands and terminology. But to the door, it's still a very new concept and still a very new thing. And there are a lot of questions about it. And so that we're really working is why is this beneficial? Like, why would we even work? You know, why would I want to do something um, that, why would I want to have a leasing arrangement and go through the extra effort of getting a leasing arrangement that could potentially be a water bank when I could just go to my neighbor and get a contract and a lease between them? And that's because the act really does allow water users a number of benefits that are really supposed to help and promote the, promote local water interests. First of all, the act puts local water users in control. You know, that's one of the main things we're trying to articulate in the project. You know, they're in the driver's seats. You design what you want. If you want it to be a small bank, it could be a small bank. If you want it to be a bigger bank, it can be a bigger bank, as long as you can get your change application approved. So, you know, really putting the local, in, local water users in control of kind of what these leasing arrangements look like. One of the other, one of the requested benefits from the water user community when we were drafting the legislation is there's a really, there's an expressed desire for a streamlined administrative process. And so we've been kind of talking a lot about that, about what does that mean? And originally our intent is to have kind of like a one-time change application to put a water right into a bank. And then once it's approved, if water can be moved into the court, you know, as long as it's uh, done uh, in bank policies. Um, that changing just a little bit as we have further discussions because we want to, like I said, meet local water user needs. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes because the price is a really good example of this. Um, forfeiture protections, you know, we're really trying to let what local water users know that like this is the, the act gives you forfeiture protections. This puts you in a place where if you're a irrigation company that has a growing and developing place of use and you don't have the amount of space that you once had to actually physically put your water to beneficial use, but you would still like to retain control over that water, you know, you can put your water in a water bank and lease it out for other uses and protect it for, from forfeiture and therefore, you know, still receive a monetary benefit from your water rights and not lose them. Access, um, you know, water access is an issue here in the state and just opening more access to folks and a bigger, you know, bigger pool of people to use that water. Um, environmental and in-stream flows, um, as I said earlier, the act is intended to hit a number of things, not just in-stream flows, but this is an expressed desire. Um, and so that's not just for environmental purposes, but also water quality purposes. Uh, if you put your water right in the water bank, there's also some condemnation protections. Um, that was one of the questions that came up. You know, I don't want to put my water right in a bank because I don't want to have it be identified as I don't need it. And so the bank actually does give you some condemnation protections if your water rights in the bank. 
And then I think this one is one that kind of got overlooked in our discussions to date. But this act really provides a ton of flexibility for local water users. Under the act, if you put your water right into a water bank, as long as bank policies allow for it and you can and you let the bank know in time and according to bank policies, you can choose whether you want your water right to operate in a bank as banked water or whether you want to use your water right as originally as originally approved under your existing uh, application to appropriate or change application. So there's a ton of flexibility here. You just have to make sure that it works within the, your, the local bank allows for that. So the other thing that we're kind of unwrapping as we are progressing through this project is really talking about and understanding the two different kinds of leasing arrangements that the Water Bank Act authorizes. So under the bank, there's kind of two, under the act, there are kind of two different leasing arrangements that could potentially be a water bank. One is a contract water bank and one is a statutory water bank. And so this is this question comes up a lot in our discussions with local water users. They're like, we're confused. What is the difference between a contract bank and a statutory bank and which one would fit here and, and what you know which one would we want to use? And you know really, in a lot of ways, um, you know contracts are something that people have been using forever to lease water. And so the act really wanted to reflect that, you know, um, those probably those kind of arrangements should probably receive the benefits of the act. And so, you know, depending on local conditions, you know, contracts are most likely going to be preferred means of organizing your leasing arrangement. And, a, and, you know, a contract is just basically setting out the terms and conditions of the use of water between a discrete set of parties. So if in your area you have five or six local water users who want to do something, you know, then um, a contract might make the most sense because it's the easiest thing for people to do. Um, and I also think that as we move, um, as we move through this, uh, that um, I think that we're going to start out with a lot of contract banks, and I think those contracts banks might eventually develop into statutory banks, because statutory banks still are going to have a leasing arrangement like a contract, but it's just going to be through a different form. And so I kind of think the contract banks are going to end up being kind of the stepping stone into these more complex statutory banks that we'll talk about in a minute. The only thing I really want to make sure that people understand, though, about these contracts contract banks um, is that you re you have to be an applicant. It has to be a non-federal public entity. And we've now run into that a couple different times. And so the reason we have that public entity involvement is so that there is a public notice component for a participating and commenting on the bank. And so I think, you know, that might end up being state agencies in a lot of places. It might end up being a local water conservancy district. It might end up being a city, you know, or, or something like that. But you really have to have this public entity element to move into to have, be a contract bank. Okay. The other way that the statute allows for leasing arrangements to be recognized is um, through what we're calling a statutory bank. And a statutory bank is a legal entity organized for the purposes of administering leasing activity between parties in a defined area. And so this is really intended to model irrigation companies, you know, like private companies that are governed by articles and bylaws. Um, these are going to be more complicated, you know, not to say that they're off the table, but there's a lot more to getting a statutory bank off the ground. Um, it may be something that, that develops in the Cache Valley area, we're not quite sure yet. Our conversations are so nascent that um, you know we're not at any we're not there at any by any means. But it is something that like you know it it might it will work. The statutory banks are going to work best when there are a lot of unknown parties, you know, like um, and there's a a lot of different water rights that could potentially be in a bank. Um, this is an area that we still have yet to develop. Um, and this is just to give you guys an idea. These are the requirements for a statutory water bank in the statute. You know, it's a pretty long list of things that people need to show the Board of Water Resources that they've accounted for. And so, um, you know, I'm interested to see how and when these statutory banks, someone takes a real hard bite at this, because these things are not anything different than what we address in articles and articles and bylaws in an irrigation company, but they're still things that do need to be addressed. So um, uh, we'll, we'll
develop. Okay. So now we're moving to like our specific pilot projects. <laughs> um, I, uh, I talked with some of you about this, but I, I um, several months of this project, I quickly learned the ambitious scope and scale of what we tried to do. <laughs> and so doing the three pilot projects simultaneously, I think is gonna be ultimately very good, but um, the it's been a little bit, uh, it's been, it's been, it's been, each has had to follow their own path for a reason. And we have kind of strategically spent more time in one of the pilot areas to start because they had a good background to start on than the other pilot areas. And so we kind of started at the beginning with kind of like all three moving on simultaneous paths and kind of quickly realized that we needed to move our efforts around just a little bit. So I have to put all of the biggest, reddest things I can possibly put on this slide. You know, these are interested water users who want to do this because they think it's going to benefit them. But all of the discussions in the pilot power areas are exploratory. Nobody is committed to anything. No arrangements have been entered. You know, every bank is different with different goals and different perspectives dependent on local interests. Okay. So the area we spent the most time in is in the Price River Pilot Study area. And the reason that we've kind of spent the most time in the price area is because there is a lot of structure already in that area from which we can build on and see how the Water Banking Act kind of graphs onto and can be incorporated. Right now, the working concept is a contract bank designed to allow carbon canal company shareholders to lease the consumptive portion of their company shares for other uses. And I have a little asterisk on that share that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you know, here is the carbon canal company, you know, generally the carbon canal company area service area you know we haven't defined it completely yet but realistically we think the bank service area is going to be something that kind of resembles this this is all the irrigated this is all the authorized irrigated irrigation for the carbon canal company um, and then this is the lower price river going down to the woodside gauge um, there's a couple uh, except for I forgot Olson reservoir which is right there this should kind of bump out like that a little bit um, so, you know, the demand in here um, is most likely going to be additional access to, for agricultural uses, but also the goal is to build off multi-stakeholder investments to rehabilitate Olson Reservoir. So here's a picture of the Olson Reservoir. And so there's been hundreds of thousands of dollars already spent in this area to get to a, to a working, re a working uh, ecosystem. So I think that this bank is going to ultimately, uh, as one of the purposes of this bank, and pro probably a primary purpose, is to provide water to Olson Reservoir. And then we're having additional discussions about whether or not it can also be an agricultural bank at the same time. Right now, the potentially interested parties um, or involved parties are kind of discrete discussions between Price River Water Users Association and um, again, these are exploratory discussions. You know, no one's committed to anything yet. Um, Carbon Canal Company, um, you know, as the shareholders, they have, have experienced past leasing program that they really benefit uh, from, and so they want to see if that leasing program can be identified, can be uh, replicated or and improved upon under the water banking statute. Um, the Nature Conservancy and Trout Limited have been working in the area for quite some time. Um, and have tons of uh, institutional knowledge. Um, Sue Belagamba and Jordan Nielsen have been amazing and they should be highly commended for their work. And then more recently, we've begun to involve the Division of Wildlife Resources in these discussions because ultimately um, they are interested in the Olson Reservoir as well. Um, I wanted to give a brief caveat about the price area. There's a lot of interest in price. There are multiple irrigation companies, there are multiple water organizations, and there are other opportunities to potentially do marketing and leasing and potentially a water bank in the price area. We have chosen to keep our discussions discreet to this particular bank to keep our, um, one, because there's a lot of um, runway to work with, and two, we just wanted to get one going and then we'll work from there. So this is where I think we're getting really interesting. So 
in actually starting to form the pilot project bank, we're really getting into the brass tacks of what's happening. And so here are some of the issues and the discussions that have happened to date in our discussions with local stakeholders. So, you know, one of the questions we have are, do existing agreements work as templates for water bank for a water bank contract under the act? You know, the company already has agreements with other water users. How does that fit under our statutory requirements for the act? Um, a very robust discussion we've had is what water is available to lease. You know, um, there's a couple different sources of water in, in a canal company. You know, there's the consumptive portion that shareholders use and apply to their ground, but there's also carrier water. And there's also some questions about what if we move towards a model that has reduced depletions? And so we've had a lot of robust discussion about that. And right now we're just gonna focus on the consumptive portion in our discussions to date. Um, the canal system is not unique in that a lot of um, other canal systems also have this, but it's a mix of natural flow rights and storage rights. And so how do we account for the different kinds of water that are inside the system in terms of what gets leased, who gets what proceeds, you know, how do we make sure that, you know, and both entities were complying with both entities bylaws and regulations. And so, you know, when you have a mixed system like this, which is very common in Utah, that discussion has come up. Um, the question is like, what are the impairments from doing a leasing system here? You know, if all of a sudden people are taking, shareholders are deciding to take, you know, large amounts of, of, their, of their parcels out of production, you know, what impairments are there to downstream water users? And the Carbon Canal Company system is a little bit unique because it is kind of like the end of the system, um, but there still are downstream water users. And so we've had a lot of discussions about what impair an impairment analysis would look like. The other thing we've talked a lot about is shepherding. And so if we do get water leased through the carbon canal company system or, um, you know, and those and that water is leased for, you know, Olson Reservoir purposes, like, do we need to have an in-stream flow designation? Does the Water Banking Act itself allow for that? Is there a need to apply under the existing in-stream flow statute? I don't think there is, but we'll come back to that. Or if there is a water right with a storage component, you know, is that already a means to shepherd it? And so we've had a lot of good discussions about how do we get, not just like physically get water from point A to point B, but how would we move water from point A to point B in a manner that has legal recognition and can be moved past uh, junior water users and junior diverters. Another question we've had is like, how do the proceeds get distributed? You know, is this, you know, to the shareholder, to the company? You know, how does this leasing arrangement work? And then because the price area is in the Colorado River Basin, there have been a lot of discussions about, you know, um, are there opportunities to do some ancillary research activities? Is there interest in doing that? Is that too much to take on right now? Is that something we want to do? Um, there's a lot of activity here in the state of Utah and there's kind of a, a balance to be struck between, you know, getting co-benefits from projects and getting a project off the ground. So that's been a good discussion. Um, so the status moving forward um, is we're going to have continued stakeholder engagement. Um, we're kind of preparing a straw man contract. Um, no one's agreed to any terms yet by any means, but we are at least trying to like get a contract uh, drafted that's at least a piece of paper that people can look at and decide whether or not this is a system that might work for leasing. Um, you know, and then we're also drafting that contract with an eye that it has to meet the requirements of the water banking statute to be approved. Um, on that note, you know, kind of in, in, um, in kind of, uh, simultaneously with the contract preparation, you know, the water banking application to the Board of Water Resources also has some specific criteria that's outside the actual contract terms. And so we're keeping an eye towards making sure we're accounting for those particular aspects as well. Um, we've had several conversations with Mark Stilson, um, the regional engineer down in Price, to talk about what a change application would look like for a water bank. You know, if a shareholder wants to put their shares in, what would that look like? Are we going to put company water in? Um, <laughs> uh, and then um, change application, working with regional engineer and distribution of draft concepts. And then timeline. We're hoping to maybe kind of have com continue to have contract discussions um, in March, uh, February through March, potentially have an application ready 
I mean, that would be a goal for from a project perspective, just to at least get one one through and, and see how it goes. Um, we don't know yet. We're, you know, everything's kind of dependent on, on uh, local interested stakeholders and moving through. Somebody had a good comment I want to comment on. <laughs> uh, correction to last sentence. Oh, wait, no, just saying that was a um, one about pricing. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So Snyderville is our other one. So the next two pilot projects, I really don't have a ton, ton to share because we're really kind of diving into things in earnest. Um, working concept, uh, organized to facilitate the running of sufficient flows in East Canyon Creek. Um, this is to maintain water levels above critical conditions um, where native fish species are not irreparably stressed and improve water quality. Um, this is, uh, we kind of started discussions in, in late summer of last year and kind of put them on hold to kind of work on the price for a little bit longer. We're now moving into more real discussions in the price, you know, Issues are, you know, we kind of need to establish a lessor for water. Um, there's general interest in having more water in East Canyon Creek for a number of reasons. Um, there's not a lot of agricultural production up there, but there are water quality and fish concerns. Um, who's going to pay for that water is kind of an outstanding question that we kind of need to figure out. Um, and then there's some sources of questions. Uh, this is a really watertight area. And so are we looking at bringing in a new tranche of water or some kind of interesting water distribution um, that, you know, some kind of orchestrated um, rotational agreement? Um, a big issue up there is distribution. You know, there's kind of a lack of measurement or security in those numbers. Um, and there's kind of, you know, th th that's a discussion to be had about what actually is the status of that. So right now, what we're doing is we're going to soon break into a subgroup to discuss incentive structures for leasing and demand. And then HDR is going to start working with the state engineer on getting a better understanding about the distribution. Obviously, the state engineer does a very good job with distribution, and we're working with the local river commissioner, but we're really trying to get kind of like a baseline on, you know, what does distribution look like? What instrumentation do we have? What are we missing? Even if we had water to lease, how would we get it past these very early priority water rights in this critical reach of the stream? So we're gonna be moving much more into the Snyderville Basin in 2021. So the lower Cache Valley area, like I said, this is our area that has kind of the least amount of um, discussion to date. You know, we're thinking, uh, a water bank organized to facilitate greater water access between agricultural uses, and we're not quite sure yet. Um, the, primary, the primary participants in the discussions to date have been mostly canal companies, um, but there have been some interest in discussions with local municipalities. Um, right now, we're trying to kind of figure out and define what the demand is. Um, there's a lot of interest in the discussion, and there's a lot of people who, who uh, a lot of stakeholders who think that there's something there there, but we're kind of trying to figure out what that is. And so that's kind of the next step for us. And then once we have kind of like identified what those transactions look like, we'll kind of inform our additional scoping analysis and systems. Um, I anticipate this discussion to continue through 2021. Um, you know, it got started a little bit later due to um, the necessities of, of working with producers. And um, I think that we're just gonna have, a, this one's gonna be a little more of a technical discussion. Okay. So what are we learning? Um, here's here are some kind of like five things that I think are, are kind of like buckets of learning. Um, and uh, I think defining the narrative. Um, this is really by water users for water users. And I think that there's still a lot of unknown about this project and there's still a lot of questions. And so um, there's still a sentiment in the state that this is an effort for urban interests or state interests to take water away from local water users. And that's never been the intent of the project. And so I think it's really important that as we move forward, defining that narrative is going to be key because at the end of the day, this is very much a by water users for water users project. The other thing that's been really interesting that we're learning is like navigating interest. Um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion about people who want to explore and do this and so there's been navigating who's really interested in kind of committing to these discussions and development of a bank there's also been some navigating of interests of sometimes um we've run into the the question of 
there's so much interest in doing something, how do we clearly define our goals to get a bank going? Um, and so navigating that level of interest has been something the project management team has been working with. The other thing is like, we have to start with demand. You know, without a clearly defined demand for the water, for the need for a leasing arrangement, you know, it's kind of an abstract theoretical discussion. And so that's been kind of like, you know, start with demand. What are, what are we really trying to meet as the demand? Um, another issue that, we, that we've really been talking about is how to account for the unique considerations that are involved with working with irrigation companies. You know, how do we design a bank that makes sure that shareholders in a company are first and foremost taken care of and not impaired by participation in a bank? How do we address the fact that the company owns the water rights, but the shareholders are the users of the water? You know, is the company going to put their water rights in the bank? Is the company going to allow shareholders to put their water rights in the bank or their, their shares in the bank? You know, how do we deal with the fact that um, we're dealing with a mutual shareholder company and accounting for their unique structure? Um, we've had a lot of discussions about shepherding and sources of water. Um, you know, the sources of water matter. You know, if it's storage water, it, it's much easier to shepherd. If it's imported water, it's much easier to shepherd. We had a great discussion about how, what we do with carrier water. Can carrier water be leased in a bank? Um, or are we, lease, are we moving le limiting banks to just the consumptive portion of, a, of an existing water right? And so those have been very interesting and great discussions. Um, another thing we're learning is that there's just a lack of, of instrumentation across the state. And so without having really good instrumentation, um, it's really hard to design something and get to brass tacks of kind of where water's moving and what we're doing. And so um, that is kind of where uh, an area that, that we see that um, is in need of and a potentially something that I've been thinking about is perhaps something that we could do in conjunction with this water banking effort is creating some kind of state innovations fund or state fund to help and assist local water users who want to build banks because it's going to be really hard to build these banks without having the right tools to do so and i think that that lack of instrumentation is going to become a problem um, going forward for people who are interested in doing this so the other thing i wanted to talk about that we're gonna i'm going to take a brief break on um, is one of the other areas we've been working pretty, we're kind of starting to really move into is what does the water bank application process look like? And that would be through the Board of Water Resources. And so um, one thing that uh, I want to kind of stop my presentation and I wanted to give Jacqueline Pacheco an opportunity to talk about kind of her work with the Board of Water Resources and how we can basically look at existing Board of Water Resources, um, Board of Water Resources processes and maybe graph that on to uh, the Water Banking Act. And then once Jacqueline's done, um, Josh, can we do like a little communications check-in as well? Okay, cool. All right, Jacqueline, you're on. Okay, um, I am going to be sharing my screen. Are you all able to see my presentation? It should say Board, Board of Water Resources funding application process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, sorry, before I start, so I, I'm an engineer at the Division of Water Resources and I work directly with the board um, with our, um, with the different um, revolving funds that we have. And I'm gonna go through the funding application process that we have with the board. And we were thinking that maybe we can use this as a model to um, develop a process for the water bank applications. So this is um, this is where um, where we get. I'm not I'm not I'm not a legal person, so this is where um, our processes were developed from. This will um, this will go through like the creation of the different revolving funds, the role that the board has, um, who is what sort of entities qualified to get funding through reference if you want to look at it in more in detail. 
So our Board of Water Resources um, consists of nine members and um, eight of them are assigned to the different river districts throughout the state. And our division director is the ninth member. Um, and when there's an applicant that wants to submit um, a funding application, they will work directly with their with their corresponding area board member. Um, and then the board member, member will turn it into um, our division and then we'll set them the process in motion. And I will go through that through that in a minute. So the board meets eight times a year and um, you have to submit your application by a deadline to be able to make it onto that meeting. Usually all of our meetings take place in Salt Lake, but they've been, we've been holding them electronically. So this is a process overview. So the graphic that you see on your left-hand side, that shows you the entire process, um, some of which the applicant is involved in and some of it which is internal. So for example, um, like I said, the applicant will submit an application to the Board of Water Resources. At that point, it's approved and then it gets sent to our division. And then um, we, we um, the staff create a feasibility report, which is, um, it, it covers the general scope of the proposed project, focuses on technical, financial, legal, and environmental aspects, water, water needs and rights, and the um, water user support. And we present that at a board meeting, um, which is called, authorization. So like I said, we, we present it to the board meeting and the applicant is given a list of requirements that they need to complete. And then from that, we move to committal of funds, which would be held at a separate meeting. Um, so the, the committal of funds report is just like a condensed version of the feasibility report. And um, after they have completed all of the requirements, we're able to move forward to, to have funding available for the project. And um, we work with either a purchase agreement or a bond, depending on the type of entity that is applying for the funding. So this is something that we can also use for the different, um, whether it's a statutory or a contract water bank. And then once we commit funds, those those funds are set aside for that particular project. And like I said, we move we move forward with the purchase agreement or bond, and then the funding is available. They go through construction, and then we close out the project once it's been completed. Um, this is this is hard to see, but we have a document that that has guidelines for applicants. So it tells you who is eligible for the different types of um, revolving loan programs that we have, and it'll give you guidelines as to like the like for example, if a project costs less than a million dollars, you're eligible for this project. If you're this type of entity, you would have to go with this revolving fund. And then we also have um, an application for financial assistance. And this one is, this one has several, um, it's, it's in several different parts. So these first two pages of the application are for all projects. So um, we can have, have something similar for the water banking where regardless of what type of water banking project it is, you would have all the information required in, in this portion of the application. And then we have um, other sections of application um, that are more specific to that type of project. So for example, if it's an agricultural project, we need certain type of information that we don't need for municipal projects or secondary irrigation projects. Um, so like I said, this is just a model and we can we can use it to, to establish our process for water banking because it's something that the board is familiar with. Okay. Emily, um, that completes my presentation. Great. And so that was just, um, so Jacqueline and I are going to be working with the board to design something similar to that process for the water banking applications. Because our the purpose in, in, in doing that is that we really don't want to overwhelm our state agencies with new or novel processes. And so where we can find a way to either mimic or uh, template an existing, pro an existing process, then you know we'd like to do that for the water banking act and the water banking applications especially where uh um for the loan funding there is a lot of kind of pre-consultation with the board about the projects before they get funded and so we're thinking here for water banking it might be really nice to have some also some pre-consultation with the board before our water bank application is approved and that way you know we you know the board can ask questions and we can kind of develop you know the, the bank as we go with the board even though it is very much 
the on the onus of the water of the interested water users and the applicant to design their bank. The, the board is not here to help them design their bank, but we do want to have a process to make sure that the board feels comfortable with the bank because at the end of the day, it is a just a completeness check. Like the board doesn't make a substantive decision on the water bank. They just make sure that you have checked all of the boxes on the statute. And so, you know, this next quarter of the project, you know, we're going to be working a lot behind the scenes to kind of see what uh, what kind of process we can get for the bank applications going. So with that, I kind of want to hand it off to Josh for a minute, and then we're going to move to an open forum. Um, Josh is with GovFriend. Him and his team have been helping with our communications. Um, Josh is just going to kind of talk about kind of their activities to date, and then I believe he's got a couple questions for the group as well. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, I'm gonna share my screen as well. Just one second. Okay, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. Um, so early on, we recognized that we needed a a central place where we can uh, give the most updated information. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about working with Emily is her focus on local and her uh, focus on not coming with preconceived answers as we go into the pilot areas, but rather asking questions and wanting feedback so that as we move towards a strategy for the state of Utah as it relates to water banking, that that, <coughs> excuse me, that that can be based on uh, the feedback, uh, the questions, um, uh, and the input from the people on the ground. So right now I have up on the screen, I have a frequently asked questions page. This is based on the most up-to-date questions that we have received. Um, I don't believe in having a frequently asked questions page that um, doesn't have any questions that have actually been asked. Um, it's one of my pet peeves people put together an FAQ and nobody, a nobody asked those questions. That's, those are just the questions that, you know, the project team wanted you to ask. Well, that's not how we want to do things here. Um, we actually want um, our FAQ to be based on your input. So um, I invite you to, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the website, I invite you guys to uh, go through, uh, give feedback. We're gonna be updating this along the way. We're gonna be updating the uh, pilot projects uh, page fairly soon here to give a little bit more information along those lines. My background is in public involvement. Um, and, and so for me, the most important thing is that we get the input that we need in order for that final strategy to be robust and to be trusted. Um, if we and, and that is something that the entire project team, and specifically Emily, um, has really given direction on is, is, is that we're dedicated to that. So that rather than uh, go through a lot of information about some things I want to bring up one more thing and then um, I actually want to just hear from you guys so um, right now we're putting together based on some of the initial lessons learned from this first phase of the project we're putting together what I call a leap analysis um, leap stands for legislative executive administrative and public um, and so what I find is when uh, usually when a project gets in trouble, it's because we didn't engage with one of those levels. We maybe we left a state agency out. Maybe we left a federal agency out. Maybe maybe there's um, tribal interests. Um, so what it is, is it's an assessment of an entire project of the stakeholders that are there. Um, we are working through. Um, that that is a living document. We'll probably miss something, but we're wanting to make sure that we reach out to everybody. Given that we are public involvement uh, focused, though, uh, and given that we want to actually, within our strategy, answer the real questions that are out there, um, Emily, with your permission, I'd actually like to transition now into the questions period. We have a couple of questions here. Um, you know, Jim asked one that I believe has already been uh, 
uh, answered. Chris, thank you so much for your input um, about how it will impact costs. We may not know, right? Right? It's early on in the process. And so there might be a lot of I don't knows right now. But what I would really love uh, if you would is if you have any burning questions, uh, anything that makes you concerned, uh, anything that you feel like we should take into consideration as we're moving forward, will you please post those questions in the comment field? We will address as many of them as we can uh, while considering you know, everybody's time. Um, but also I want to make note of those because we want to have an inventory of questions that we know that we should be answering in order to put that strategy together. So those burning questions, criticisms, uh, feedback, uh, it, it would be very nice for you guys to put those in the comment field right now. Um, and then we can work through what we can now and then know that those are some answers that we need to get to you uh, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> And this is really intended just to be. Whoa. And this is intended to be a um, an open forum for anybody too. Like this is you know this is kind of like the working group part of the meeting. So you guys are the working group, and so it's a, you know no no limits. Brainstorm ideas, thoughts, concepts. So. Okay, so Ben Jensen asked, you mentioned the Water Banking Act authorizes in-stream flow, such as an in-stream flow application would be not necessary. Will you please elaborate on that point in thought? Yes, thank you, Ben, because that's actually one of the things and the what are we learning. So the state of Utah already has a, uh, um, a um, the state of Utah already has an in-stream flow uh, uh, statute, 73330. Um, I believe, or 331. And that in-stream flow statute is kind of a narrow statute in that um, only certain entities can hold water rights for in-stream flows. Um, the change application to convert a water right to an in-stream flow is for a, a short a period of time. Um, you can't have any intervening diverters. Um, and the change application receives the lowest priority, um, the junior priority um, in the system. And so, so um, one of the concerns that we heard from the water user community in assessing and, and developing the Water Banking Act was that um, was that it uh, that particular statute was difficult to deal with. And so, under the Act, the way we address that is we said that a once a water right has been approved to be in a water bank. It can be an approved, um, the terminology in the lease or in this act is we're gonna say you're gonna deposit your water right into the water bank. That water right can be leased for any purpose authorized or consistent with the act. And so the act says that water rights are that the purposes of the act are to facilitate, one of the purposes among many is to um, promote and facilitate water for in-stream for environmental and water quality purposes. And so our understanding as the drafting group was that that was supposed to be kind of a way to provide more flexibility for water users and to uh, provide more access to water for in-stream flow um, demands. Um, there has been a question about whether or not if there is an in-stream flow uh, intended use, we also have to use that 7331-331 statute. Um, I do not think that that is why, I don't think that that was the intention when the act was was designed and drafted by the drafting group, um, but that is still an unknown. Um, I, I think that the purpose for doing the water, one of the many purposes for doing the Water Banking Act was to kind of like release ourselves from some of the constraints and limitations of that particular provision. Um, I want to be really clear here, though. Um, the act is for multiple purposes. It is for agriculture. It is for, you know, if it, it were, makes sense to have like a long term, you know, lease for municipal development that people feel comfortable with for long term for a, a stable supply that could happen for water quality purposes that could happen like in stream flows have gotten a lot of attention. But that being said, the act is really intended to be very open um, and for multiple uses. This is not an in-stream flow act. This is a multi-purpose act. Okay. 
All right, so we also had another comment about from Chris Klein. First, we'll go back up. She says, you know, have we looked about what water banking will do to affordability? Um, water prices will be driven up to the point where less funded agencies can't afford water um, and someone might be driven out. Yeah, that's a concern that we've definitely had. Um, we definitely, in our drafting discussions, talked about, you know, those well-funded um, interests may be able to kind of dominate um, dominate the, the market. That being said, one of the benefits and purposes of the act is to create flexibility. And so, you know, the, the pricing is going to be set per bank. And I just saw Brett come along. Brett, do you want to answer that question? I, I don't know if I can answer it as much as provide some perspective. Uh, in most of the Western U.S., uh, municipal entities don't like to lease water. Um, they Their whole job is to reduce uncertainty and be reliable. And there are places where municipal leasing happens, but municipal leasing is not a, a, a dominant thing in the Utah water market. I think this legislation is exploring how that might, you know, evolve over time to preserve ag lands while also meeting municipal demands. But I think the concept that the municipal entities are all of a sudden going to start leasing water and driving prices up is probably not what's going to happen. Um, at least not right away. It's it, you know that would be a, a long term evolution, um, and I think short term um, you're going to see sort of um, a continued acquisition of water rights by municipal entities, at least the the sort of small, fast growing ones, and more leasing activity around the margin of that. So uh, leasing to augment wells or um, sort of fill voids in their supply portfolio. I think that's much more likely. Um, so the short answer is, I don't think so. But that's something that this water bank effort is going to explore. Um, and it is uh, to be, and it's, I'll also say it's hyper local. So uh, the price of water in one county often has no relevance to the price of water in another county. And so, you know, small markets may form uh, over a long period of time. Um, and we'll see what happens with all that. But um, if pricing does go up because municipal entities are interested in leasing water through a water bank structure, on some level, that's the point. That's the idea of what we're working towards is not is sort of trying to provide leasing as a source of supply um, instead of buy, ultimately buying out and drying up farmland. So a lot to unpackage there, but I think in the short term, I don't expect that to happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. But it's a great question. It's yeah. a great question. Okay, so what else we got? We got um, Pat Shea asks, what steps are being taken to have this effort less Salt Lake City centric, Salt Lake centric beyond occasional visits out back? I don't really see this as a Salt Lake City centric effort, honestly. Um, I mean, I think this, it's, it, this statute is written to be pretty generic on how and where it can be applied. And so, um, you know, one thing I did not include in this in this presentation because it is a little bit beyond the scope of what we need to talk about today is outside these three pilot projects. I bet I've talked with 12 different groups that are interested in exploring water banking. And of those 12, I don't think any of them sit in the Salt Lake Valley, maybe one. And so um, I, I think it's a pretty generic act that is really intended to, to, to meet the local water users where they at where they're at both physically and conceptually. Emily, can I speak one more thing yes. to that? Yes. Uh, this is an open forum. Go big, Peter. And I'm wondering if Pat might be looking at it in terms of uh, if you're talking effort um, in terms of to get to where the legislation was even passed, those outreach sessions, I mean, and, and you know, you talked about how many you did, but boy, every corner of the state, and and that was the attempt to do sort of the ground truth thing and to to get that feedback from from the guys that are managing the water and moving the water. Um, so, you know, in terms of the development, you know, that's what you're working on now. But in terms of to what we even developed, oh, looks looks like Pat can uh, respond himself. He just yeah. raised his hand. I'll I'll stop there. Where is Pat? is like the uber Brady Bunch. Pat, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I'm uh, digitally illiterate, I think is the best way of describing it. Uh, my question really relates to what I perceive to be what I sometimes call the I-70 borderline between northern Utah and southern Utah. And it does seem to me that we need to have some way in which both sides of the I-70 line have some kind of permanent representation on decisions that are being made. Certainly the legislature reflects that. But once the legislature ends their 45 days, I think the people uh, south of the I-70 line need to have uh, comfort uh, that they will have a permanent uh, kind of voice in how these things are developing. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really fair comment. And I think that, that, you know, it's incredibly important that people, that water users across the state feel like their voices are heard, you know, from all the different sectors that are involved, because, you know, it's all one water at the end of the day, and we all got to be on the same page about kind of what we're doing. Um, this act is generic. And so, you know, if there are water users who want to take it, take advantage of it on the northern side of I-70, go for it. If there are water users that want to take advantage of it on the southern side of I-70, go for it. Um, you know, I, it, um, I think that in doing part of this process is also not just the pilot projects, but we are going to do a statewide water marketing report. And that water marketing report has an, will have an extensive public outreach component as well. And maybe Josh, maybe because that's kind of Josh's that's Josh's wheelhouse. But we're going to basically kind of replicate what we did with the road show to get the dra legislation drafted for the report and kind of a, a little more of a truncated version. But go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I think it's something to uh, for us to always keep in mind and the uh, the thing that I hear over and over and that we're trying to stay focused on is that these are locally developed. And so um, the water banks that are uh, some water banks that are developed south of that line may need um, some unique features um, that uh are th that are not needed north of that line for example right so that that's where some of the there are some uh specific local needs that we recognize and and that i think is one of the powerful things about the process that we're going through is that if this is not a top down this is a bottom up we're here to provide resources to those who are interested in developing it locally and developing it in the way that works for them locally. Um, and I, so I think, Patrick, I think that that's actually a really powerful part of what we're doing um, as far as what will be able to address your concerns. Because in the end, this strategy won't necessarily come out and say, here's the one size fits all. It will give best practices and tools for, those, for people to uh, develop locally. Great. Okay. So Ryan Goodrich asks, will you help me understand the funding options? Is funding available in order to set up a bank? Is it intended for entities that need to add infrastructure to add a water, water to a bank, et cetera? So right now we have limited funding to assist with the three pilot project areas in exploring these concepts. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's our services to the project management team to provide expert analysis for scoping tasks and, and facilitation and, um, you know, kind of like the skills to get the project going. And then there's a smaller pot of money to kind of help with uh, instrumentation or on the ground operations for the pilot period. But that is limited to those three pilot projects. So there is not currently any kind of state funding available for water banks. But that being said, I think one thing that we are learning is that there is a lot of interest in developing water banks. And I think a barrier that we're going to quickly see is going to be um, a, a lack of instrumentation and a lack of kind of um, uh, a lack of getting to some baseline questions because we don't have um, some instrumentation that we're going to need. Um, so I think probably realistically going forward, one of the recommendations that's going to come out of this project is to create some kind of state fund, you know, maybe similar to the state revolving loan fund, but not on that scale that could be for assisting water banking efforts. Um, and that's, we don't know. I mean, that's something that um, is not by any means as part of this project now, but I think that need for funding to assist water users to take advantage of the act is going to be a very real thing. 
Um, Rod Smith says, could this program have a role in Utah's efforts to consider Colorado River demand management efforts with the upper basin states? Potentially. Um, I, I think that realistically, I want to come back to what Josh said, is that um, this is going to be, this is at its heart, a local project. And so if local water users want to participate in a bank that has those goals, the statute is very much, you know, uh, would be able to accommodate that. But I think that it's going to go back to whatever the local water users want to create and what kind of bank, you know, would meet their needs. Um, and so at this point in time, that's not the role of this project. But um, I definitely think that there are tools that we're developing that if there is interest from the local side to do that, it, it could be a tool. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, I mean, and this is continuing too. You can always submit questions on our website through info at utahwaterbank.org. And we'll also, you know, put those in our FAQs as well. So. Well, all hundred of you and no one's got any other questions. We didn't do that good of a job. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if no one has, oh wait, Chris has one, so so I didn't see that one. What about private leasing safe for a power plant? Um, so this act is not intended to supersede or take, replace any other particular leasing arrangements. It's just one more tool in the toolbox. And so if there is a water user who wants to do a private lease with a, with a you know, like a large water user, like a power plant, then, you know, go for it, you know, make a lease that works for your needs. Um, there's no, um, if, if you don't need the benefits of the act and you can kind of do what you want on your own terms under your own authorities, then, um, then that is fully available to water users. The act and water banks under the act are solely intended to be um, a voluntary activity and intended to uh, bring benefits that might otherwise not be available. So um, private leasing. So as the thermal power generation declines, uh, I, I think what you're saying is that there probably will be uh, larger tranches of water coming online from uh, power plants in the state. Is that what Jim? Yeah, I, I, I very much think that that's probably going to be a real, realistic scenario here in the state of Utah as we reassess our um, power portfolio. That um, I think there's definitely going to be uh, uh, additional water that might be available for lease. And some of that already happens now, um, actually in the price area. Um, and we are not looking at that particular auction or leasing arrangement for our project, um, besides just some from informational background. But um, I definitely think that that is something that is on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I do have one question for the group real quickly before we before we um, depart. Um, this is intended to be like a public forum. Um, originally, we had kind of intended to have quarterly meetings uh, like this to keep the public informed. I think with the pace of development, quarterly seems a little robust because I don't want to bore people with you know the same information. And so I think going forward, I want to recommend like a biannual meeting. You know, like we'll probably have one like midsummer um, to kind of bring people up to speed. Um, that would be my preference because I think that's about the pace where we are with new information. Um, is it any okay, Peter Gessel? That's a good idea. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Soran's got a thumbs up. Okay. Well, you guys, if you want, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of information on our website. Um, we are going to be updating that website continually. Um, it's still a little bit out. There's still a couple outdated things because we've been so focused on working with the water users um, that we I need to we need to get in there and kind of update a couple items. Um, but it's intended to be a tool for the public. We're going to continue to update it here in the next coming month or two. We're going to really put a lot of focus into the website as we kind of build out our discussions with the public. Um, and so please go there for information. You're welcome to contact anybody on our project management team. If you have a question, you can go to info at utahwaterbank.org. That's a good way to get a hold of somebody. Um, otherwise, um, you can always email me at my firm, which is eel at clydesnow.com. Um, I'd rather have you go through the water banking website, though, because it can go to a number of people. Um, but yeah, we're here for you. So reach out. 
Simon or Simon Soren Soren Simonson has his question hand up. Sorry. Oh, he does. Oh, I didn't see that. Tell your name, Soren. Sorry about that. Soren, go for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just a little bit of a logistics question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, at the beginning of the presentation, you noted that there were some like continuing education credits for those working in the law field. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to set it up for that kind of program for other disciplines? I may be one of the few non-attorneys uh, <laughs> in, in the session, but uh, I, I'm a certified planner, for example. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, is this something we could explore to get continuing education for that as well? I know I can self-report, but um, it might be useful for others working around water issues. Yeah, I am all about double or triple or quadruple dipping. You know what I mean? And so if okay. you are, if you need to get CLE credit or, you know, continue education credit through your professional organization, if you're a PE or a planner, um, I don't know how to do that because I don't know who your organization is. But, you know, we're very open to having, you know, people receive benefit from these meetings. And if, if that's something that would help people, absolutely. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, we'll probably put out an invite for the next one midsummer. And so, you know, if that is something that you want, you know, if you can contact us when that invite comes out or, you know, we can coordinate with, with whomever your organization is, you need to get it to be accredited. Okay. Would you be the point person on that or somebody else? Uh, I'd probably be the point person. And then we'd probably like work with who, you know, like I would, I'd probably say, that's a great idea, Soren. Why don't you contact the planning okay. people and have them do the thing they need to do? Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll try and connect you with the executive director for the uh, American Planning Association chapter. Yeah. Um, and, and she can work on that. Americans, yeah. it's, it's AICP accreditation that requires continuing education on a biannual basis. So. Yeah, and if I'll there's PEs them. or something like that too, I know that there's a lot of engineers yeah. on these calls. Yeah. Um, one person did ask, they said, how do I get on the water banking email list? Uh, that is a great question. <laughs> um, I would send an email to info at utahwaterbank.org. Um, and so that might be a really good way to do it. Um, and then we can kind of add you. Um, the email distribution list is in a little bit of transition because originally it was through Senator Janie, Janie Iwamoto's office when we were the working group. And then when we moved to it being the project management group, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're including everybody who's now been expanded in the conversation. And so if you're here on a new, if you're, if you're newly here and want to be on the list, either put it in the chat column or email info at utahwaterbank.org and we'll make sure you get on the expanded list. Um, and then, uh, you know, hopefully we can have everybody, you know, at the next one. We'll also be, I mean, we love to flyer things. We, you will know it's happening. <laughs> so invite your friends and, and we'll get, get people going along. Emily, yeah. one other quick question. Um, are, are there any legislative um, potential issues this session? I know there's, um, I haven't seen the bill released yet, but I know discussion about perhaps combining several natural resource and environmental quality programs under one kind of super department. Mm -hmm. Will that affect this program in any way? Or is there anything else in the legislature to be aware um, of? Yeah, that's Casey Snyder's bill. Um, I have not thought about whether or not that'll affect things. Um, I am not quite sure that's a great question. Um, I think we'll probably just have to track and see how that bill develops. Um, you know, uh, I would assume, I don't know by any means, and you know what happens when you assume, but <laughs> making such a large transition like that would probably require some kind of study. And so, um, you know, like, that that you know whoever is compiling that study of what that looks like we'll just have to run it up the flagpole that this is one of those programs um we already have input from both both departments you know water quality right. and natural resources so i don't think it'll affect the actual function of the project um but we are under dwre as our funder um and so we'll just have to see how that goes so but that's yeah. a great question okay. well thanks for the great update today great Cool. All right. Well, hopefully we can talk later as we go on. And um, I look forward to seeing the Uber Brady Bunch in uh, probably July-ish. So like a one-year update. So, okay. Now watch all the numbers drop. <laughs>